grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Tell me, do you have any leftovers in your fridge? How many meals worth of leftovers are sealed up in Tupperware containers and Ziploc baggies in your fridge right now? Ah, don't pause this and go check. The exact number is not important. And maybe given that we're sheltering in place this week, you've stocked up in preparation, not knowing when you'd get to go to the grocery store again. But even in regular circumstances throughout the nation, the poorest among us have far more than the poor of other countries. Americans have access to an abundance of food and an abundance of cheap food. You can get all the cheese puffs and Easy Mac you could ever want in our country. And given the recent press coverage, we now know that many, many Americans will be able to take care of their consumption of the abundance of their food, their leftovers, for years to come. You know, given the hoarding of toilet paper that's going on in reaction to the coronavirus, I guess what goes in, <laughs> well, it has to come out. <laughs> leftovers. What is with the toilet paper thing? Leftovers. When I was a kid, I remember being told to clean my plate like, like many kids. But I don't remember if my parents ever actually used that cliche reasoning of there being starving kids in some other part of the world to emphasize why I needed to eat all my vegetables. I don't remember if that ever happened in my family. But I do remember not really being a fan of having leftovers. In fact, you can ask Jessica, to this very day, I'm not the biggest fan of leftovers. And when, whenever we do eat leftovers, if I have it my way, I like to kind of skip a day or two, if it'll keep, skip a day to trick myself. See, if I don't eat the same meal back to back, well, it kind of feels like the leftover meal isn't actually leftover. It kind of feels like Jessica made it fresh and new because I didn't just have it yesterday. Yes, I am that simple and easy to fool. Today's readings present us with a topic of leftovers, don't they? In the gospel reading, we hear that Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. Our Old Testament reading from Exodus 16, it also speaks of leftovers. It provides a backdrop to Christ's miraculous feeding of the 5,000. As there in Exodus, we heard how God fed Israel with quail and manna in the wilderness so that Israel would know, as he said, that I am Yahweh, your God. Let's see, Exodus 16, starting at verse 13. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning... Dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. I don't know about you, but flake and frost, I can't read this without thinking of frosted flakes. I don't know. They're great. When the, when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each, each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, 
Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stink. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, each new day, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. All right, well, what we're going through right now, this coronavirus pandemic and all of our efforts to combat it, it's an opportunity for us, for the Christian, to, to recall where our trust lies. It's a time for a reality check for us who normally live in an abundance. It's a time to reflect on who our God truly is. And then to repent. To repent of our sin and be forgiven as God loves to forgive. What do we pray in the prayer our Lord taught us? What did, what did Jesus himself teach us to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. From the Lord's Prayer, right? Our daily bread. We're all going through a situation that can easily heighten fear. They can cause anxiety and worry. A situation that motivates, motivates us to think about what we can do to provide for ourselves and for our loved ones, for those who are living under our roof, those in our tent, to borrow the language from Exodus 16. But you, dear Christian, you have nothing to fear. Not during this pandemic, not ever. You have no need to ever be anxious, to ever worry. No need. What's the worst that can happen to the Christian? Even death has been hijacked by the power of Christ, by his cross. It has been turned into gain. Even death should not frighten you. For us, for, for us right now, sin is the thing we are to guard ourselves against. Sin, not running out of food, not running out of toilet paper, not worrying about where you know, our income will come from or any of that stuff. Those are concerns, but they are not the cause of our worry. They are nothing for us to fear. For us right now, sin, being tempted to not trust God is the thing we are to guard ourselves against and to be concerned with. Being led into sin amidst the chaos and commotion in our community. That is the thing that we are to be worried about, concerned with, not overly worried, but that we are to guard against. Especially during this unusual time, but all the time. We are to guard ourselves against sin. And so let me help you do that right now by reminding you of a very simple truth that every one of us needs to be reminded of. You are not your God. You are not your God. And what I mean by that is that we tend to look to ourselves to provide us with what we need to live, right? We tend to trust in our own ability, our own actions, our own decisions for our security, our well-being, our food. Our daily bread that we pray for in the Lord's Prayer, it includes everything that has to do with support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, a devout spouse, devout children, devout and faithful rulers, good government, yes, even in the midst of a crisis, good weather, peace, health, health. 
self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, everything, every single thing that we need to live on a day-to-day -day basis, all of it is given to you by God. Not by you. It is given to you by Yahweh the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, in our cultural context, in normal circumstances, it's easy for us to forget who our God is because of our abundance. We say we know. As Christians, we say we know, but typically, we all act like we're our own gods. When life is normal and everything is readily available, we act like we can provide our for ourselves. If I want cheese puffs, I just go down to the grocery store and buy them. No big deal. We don't stop and think that God provided that for us. So it is almost easier in the midst of our abundance to forget our God, to trust in him. And if we're out of the habit of trusting him in easy, good times, how much more so? How much harder is it for us to trust in him in bad times? We have not prepared ourselves to do that. We act like there is no God, like the sky is falling. But as baptized Christians, those who received the Holy Spirit and live by faith in Christ Jesus, who died for you on the cross of Calvary, you know, though like me, you need to be reminded. You know that you're not your own God. That everything you need for life, everything is provided to you by the one true God. My friends, take this time. Take this, this time right now. It's an unusual time we're living in. We're dealing with unusual circumstances. Take this opportunity to consider what you believe according to Holy Scripture. What do you believe? And whether or not you are living out your faith in normal times and in the midst of this pandemic. As Christians, you believe in a good and gracious God who is in control who is all-knowing and all-powerful, the one who led his people out of slavery in Egypt and gave them freedom, who fed them in the wilderness miraculously with quail and manna, giving them enough for their daily needs each and every day, repeating it every morning, who proved by that that he was their God. He could be trusted to provide for them. That they didn't have to stockpile rations and save leftovers, Ziploc it up, throw it in the Tupperware and tuck it in the fridge. They didn't have to do that. You believe in the one true God who continued to care for his people each and every day in the midst of their very long crisis. You believe in the one who took on flesh and died on the cross to remove your sins. That you would be baptized into his death and into his resurrection, freed from slavery under the law, giving his body as true bread, the true bread from heaven so that you could eat his flesh and drink his blood and in doing so receive the miraculous meal that his feeding of the 5,000 foreshadowed. You believe in the one who tells us to store up our treasure not in our pantries and closets and refrigerators but in heaven. So you didn't get the last pallet of toilet paper at Costco. <laughs> Whatever that's about. It's okay. You have the flesh of Christ that wipes away all your sins, 
all your filth. So you didn't get the last bottle of hand sanitizer. It's going to be okay. You have the blood of Christ that cleans not only your flesh, but also your soul. You brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. The promise is that you've been forgiven all your sins, even those sins that reveal your lack of trust in God. Those sins that turn you into your own God. Idolatry of self. And reveal that you don't trust your heavenly father, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as much as you trust yourself. You've been given a promise. It's the same promise that frees you. Set you free to pray for your daily bread. Though the world says, what's wrong with you? Get off your knees and run down to the grocery store and buy every single thing you can get your hands on, whether you need it or not. What's wrong with you? Get up, silly Christian. You believe in the promise that says, no, I'm doing what I need to be doing. The needful thing, the good thing. I'm relying on him who gives me my daily bread each morning. It's the promise that Paul believed that enabled him to write what we read in Philippians 4, 12 and 13. I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot in any and all circumstances, even in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him, Christ Jesus, crucified for me, him who strengthens me. It's the promise of Christ crucified and resurrected for you. It's the promise that you will live forever with Christ in the new heavens and the new earth, that death, death cannot hurt you, that hell or the lack of toilet paper cannot soil the truth that Christ Jesus is all you need in every circumstance. He's done everything for you. Yes, whether it's a normal American day of abundance or during this coronavirus crisis. Jesus still, still today provides you with all you need and more. Indeed, he provides you with life everlasting with him. There is nothing left over, nothing left outstanding, nothing left for you to secure or provide for yourself. There is nothing, dear saint, for you to fear. Nothing to be anxious about. Nothing to worry about. Christ made sure of that truth on the cross where he provided for you everything you need for your daily life. Himself. He provided himself. This is true. And so we say, Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep you in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.